let's go right to, right to the program. So uh, tonight we we're fortunate to have with us Dr. Mark McIntosh, the Vice President for Research and Economic Development with the University of Missouri System. He's also Vice Chancellor for Research here at University of Missouri. And he will give us some remarks and introduce our keynote speaker. So please, Dr. Mark McIntosh. Good, can you hear me? Good, thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you, uh, as, uh, uh, as was already mentioned, uh, it, uh, the weather turned out to be very interesting, but so thank you for, for being here. I didn't realize it could uh, snow uh, when it's this cold, but clearly, clearly I didn't pay attention uh, uh, well enough when I was in um, uh, class uh, as an undergraduate. So um, uh, it's, 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 great for, it's great to be here with all of you. It's great to kick off this 10th uh, symposium. Um, I, was, uh, uh, I was asked to uh, uh, give the introductions, and, and uh, then I saw the, um, the um, agenda that came out, and, and they gave me 30 minutes uh, for these introductory <laughs> remarks. And I said, well, so why does it take 30 minutes to uh, introduce a keynote speaker, and then uh, and then I met uh, Rodolph last night. Uh, had dinner and listened to his life story and his career development program and stuff. And uh, quite frankly, I'm not sure 30 minutes is going to be enough. Uh, so we'll see. So um, well, so this is the uh, kickoff for the uh, 10th annual uh, Agroforestry Symposium. Um, I did a little background on agroforestry. Uh, it was the, the center here was established in 1998. Uh, with the purpose of uh, contributing to the science underlying agroforestry practices involving intensive land use management, combining trees and shrubs with crops and livestock. Um, the Center for Agroforestry supports the long-term future of rural and urban working farms and forests by focusing on environmental and social sustainability. Long-term research teaching and technology transfer efforts help make a better state national and global economy. Um, they do this by educating and training students, one of their really uh, important uh, contributions to the, um, to the uh, economic impact of the state and the nation. Uh, professionals, scientists, leaders, and the general public, uh, educating the general public is a significant part of their, of their mission. Discovering, integrating, and applying new agroforestry knowledge and technologies to promote economic environment uh, economic, environmental, and social vitality. So this symposium uh, will feature panel discussions uh, on entrepreneurship, translation of research, and building effective university industry partnerships. It also has a poster session uh, so that students and faculty can present some of their latest research. Uh, it will talk about effective university industry partnerships. It will uh, also include uh, an exhibit hall showcasing examples of successful entrepreneurship and commercial development emerging from both Missouri research and collaborations around the state. I want to take this opportunity also to thank the sponsors, so both the corporate sponsors and our academic sponsors for um, um, being a part of this program. So um, tonight, um, uh, you know, in my 30 minutes uh, before introducing the keynote speaker, uh, I've been asked to give a couple of uh, remarks about the uh, Missouri Research Enterprise, a look at where we're headed, and I'm going to share with you some recent successes uh, from our faculty-driven uh, innovations as well. So, uh, as you all know, uh, MU is a flagship AAU land-grant public research institution with a Carnegie R1 rating. Recently, uh, under new leadership at the university, uh, we have set out to chart a very important and aggressive new course that will improve our scholarly productivity. We're going to do that in multiple ways, uh, including investing in our existing faculty who've, are, who've brought us to this level of uh, research um, capability. We're going to invest significantly in infrastructure to help our scientists uh, continue their um, outstanding work. We have to do this by building a culture of excellence and stimulating collaborations, not only within the research community on this campus, but we have th 
three other universities that are part of our system that can contribute to that capability as well. Most importantly, the decisions driving these investments will be data-driven decisions based upon the, um, uh, the, the, the very important research activities of our faculty and students. So some of the data that we're going to use have to do with our research metrics, the research metrics that are critical to our AAU standing, the research metrics that really drive a lot of our land-grant uh, opportunities. The chancellor has set out a very aggressive program for us to grow those research metrics over the next five years. What you can see in this slide is an aggressive attempt to double our research expenditures over the next five years from a level that's, that was $205 million in FY18 to about $413 million in FY23. Uh, this will include both federal research expenditures, state and uh, corporate research expenditures, and um, uh, the attempt to grow uh, a, an innovation and entrepreneurship network that will spin off uh, research companies uh, at a much more rapid rate. Uh, those kinds of increases in research metrics bring along with it very important other contributions, increases in publications, increases in citations, increasing increases in national recognition for our faculty, which will be a very important component. We also expect to grow more research in the form of national centers. So a center like the Center for Agroforestry, we want to be able to um, uh, incentivize them and support them to go after national recognition as centers of excellence. Um, that effort has already uh, resulted in significant new uh, activity from our faculty. There are at least six different national center applications that are pending with the federal government at this point in time, many more than we've had in the recent past. So I believe our faculty are really uh, in engaged and encouraged to be a part of this uh, advanced um, uh, research uh, enterprise. As I said, we also have to invest significantly in uh, infrastructure. Um, we intend to build more of these multidisciplinary centers. We intend to recruit some of the best global talent to campus by prioritizing the key things that incentivize faculty uh, to be successful. Uh, these sometimes include uh, the ability to engage with the community through social and behavioral sciences types of centers. Uh, we have uh, a recent um, um, philanthropic contribution that built the Novak Leadership Institute on this campus, which will allow us to train leaders of the future. Uh, we are developing um, uh, interdisciplinary centers in science communication. We are developing an artist in residence program uh, to interact with um, both social and behavioral scientists and STEM-based scientists. Um, to make sure that we look at uh, these research centers from multiple perspectives. In, the, in addition, we have invested significant resources in core facilities, uh, four or five of which actually are in this facility it, itself. Uh, these things include the Animal Modeling Corps. I see Elizabeth Bride here in the audience who runs the, uh, the Animal Modeling Corps. She also runs an NIH-funded uh, uh, rat resource center. We have one of the four mutant mouse resource centers on this campus as well, and we have the only swine uh, research and resource center on this campus. So three NIH-funded resource centers give us an unbelievable opportunity to, to generate animal models for uh, uh, both uh, looking at both animal disease and human disease uh, capabilities. Um, we have invested pretty significantly in the omics. Uh, the omics cores are really kind of concentrated in this building, metabolomics, proteomics, genomics, uh, and soon there will be, there'll be others. Um, we have invested heavily, and as you'll see in a few minutes, we're going to continue to invest heavily in imaging modalities, whether it's, um, whether it's light microscopy and super resolution microscopy, uh, the highest and most recent technologies in electron microscopies, including cryo-EM, uh, and new modalities that will go into our new research center that have to do with uh, MRI, PET, and SPEC-CT kinds of imaging for large animal models of disease. We're also investing heavily in research centers, research facilities, uh, bricks and mortar capability to give our scientists 
uh, new opportunities. The East Campus Plant Growth Facility uh, is already under construction and should be ready, I believe, uh, in, in um, the next uh, academic year. Uh, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about a new enterprise called the Translational Precision Medicine Complex that we hope to break ground on in April or May of this coming spring. The East Campus uh, Plant Growth Facility, many of you have seen it uh, uh, on the East Campus uh, going up. It, this is phase one of what we hope is a $90 million overall project to bring the latest in plant growth technologies to the very productive plant growth plant uh, scientists that we have on this campus. Gives us tremendous new capabilities uh, that we haven't uh, had in the past on this campus. More room for tall plants, bioenergy grasses, and even trees. Uh, areas where we can regulate environmental conditions, areas where we can look at interactions between the root uh, uh, microbiome and uh, plant nutrition and various other kinds of technologies. The most uh, aggressive undertaking we'd have, we've had on this campus since this building was built in 2004 is the Translational Precision Medicine Complex. This is a 275,000 square foot, $250 million enterprise. As I said, we'll break ground in the late spring uh, on this particular facility. So we're in the final stages now of design and, um, and in um, um, program planning for uh, that building going forward. Those of you who are interested in a little bit more detail about where this project is, we're going to hold a, uh, a uh, progress uh, symposium next Wednesday at, at noon uh, in the um, Reynolds Alumni Center to bring uh, the campus up to date about this particular project. <clears throat> Uh, this building will be, is the highest capital priority for the entire University of Missouri system. And it will involve enterprises from all four universities. So we will bring um, engineers together with um, 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 our veterinary scientists, our clinical scientists from the School of Medicine. There are very important groups in the uh, College of Agriculture and animal reproductive scientists who are helping us make the models for this particular um, uh, enterprise. Uh, there are important contributions from radiopharmaceutical chemistry and other uh, 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 research pieces from our campus. Um, the vivarium in this facility will be large enough to handle um, uh, animals as large as some of our experimental pigs, uh, and it will have imaging capabilities uh, for imaging those animals uh, as research models. The purpose of this facility is to create strategic partnerships, strategic partnerships among the colleges on this campus, strategic partnerships among the four universities in our system, strategic partnerships with other institutions around the state, like Wash U's uh, School of Medicine, uh, and strategic partnerships with industry. Uh, and we're working very, very closely now with four or five major uh, pharmaceutical and uh, radio pharmaceutical companies and imaging companies, imaging technology companies to be a part of this facility. It will have a significant amount of innovation space in it where scientists from uh, companies will be working side by side with our research scientists. The Precision Medicine Initiative is a little bit bigger than just the building itself, and it involves a lot of work that's going on in those many colleges that I already mentioned to you. Really, the concept here is taking basic research from bench to bedside. Taking basic research, working with both our veterinary uh, clinicians and our, uh, and our um, um, uh, medical clinicians from the School of Medicine to develop the latest in clinical trials for the uh, research innovations that come out of this center. To scale these things up, it will have clean room capabilities in it so we can scale these things up to production capabilities, to interact uh, with industry in terms of best practices and commercialization, and of course, as a revenue stream uh, for the university. So as I mentioned, uh, driving collaborations is really a central point part of the research growth plan going forward. 
Uh, we are uh, a very comprehensive university with some very important opportunities going forward, whether it's in the biomedical field, the bioengineering field, uh, the Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, and many other areas. And right now, there are significant opportunities for collaboration, whether it's across the UM system, as the Precision Medicine Initiative that I just mentioned to you, or whether it's with other institutions. We already have a pretty strong partnership with Washington University in various medical aspects as a part of their CTSA program. Uh, we have uh, uh, opened up uh, a dialogue with the Stowers Medical Research Institute in Kansas City uh, to have their faculty be uh, adjunct faculty uh, on our campus and work with us in some of these translational precision, precision medicine initiatives. And as many of you in this room know, we have a very strong and continuing growing partnership with the Donald Danforth Plant Sciences Center and in fact, uh, Bayer Monsanto um, plant scientists in the St. Louis area as well. The Danforth Center collaboration has been a success to this point in time. Uh, the partnership really started out as an opportunity for us to recruit faculty together, faculty who would be part of the Danforth Center in St. Louis and part of our campus here. And that has worked very, very well. Three of four positions that we, that we developed as a part of this partnership have already been recruited, and we're currently uh, in the process of uh, beginning the, um, uh, the uh, 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 in, uh, the uh, interviews with a fourth candidate, which we hope to be able to develop rel uh, relatively soon. These faculty have already been successful in the very early stages of this scientific uh, partnership. Now, um, now that I've given you an idea of some of the research uh, um, uh, efforts that we are beginning to stimulate on the campus, we've got to turn our attention to to what you're going to hear most over the next day or so, and that's the technology um, uh, development side of this particular uh, enterprise. Uh, we have to become a um, seamless uh, and very progressive um, uh, enterprise to be able to work with our in, uh, innovation scientists and students to develop their technologies. You're going to hear a whole lot from our keynote speaker here about uh, how to break down some of those barriers how to make some of these uh, in, uh, enterprises attractive to industry. Um, a recent economic impact study of the University of Missouri indicated that Mizzou has a $3.9 billion impact on the state of Missouri. Uh, and we support more than 46,000 jobs across the state. From the point of view of the state uh, legislature and the governor's office, this is a significant enterprise that needs to be grown going forward. And I'm uh, happy to say that we have a, uh, a, an administration uh, in the governor's mansion at this point in time who seems to value that and the, and the contributions that higher education make to the economy of the state. But we can do more to grow our economic impact. Uh, we have already begun a, a, begun a very thorough uh, reorganization of our economic development efforts. Uh, we will be interviewing on campus over the next few weeks. Um, people as the new director of our technology advancement office, helping us move IP through the system as quickly as possible and get it uh, into um, uh, development uh, with industry. We're prepared to do this through various mechanisms, innovation and entrepreneurship training, not just for our students, but for our faculty as well. Technology advancement, and most importantly, industry partnerships and engagement. Now, we've been doing a little bit of this for a while. We've had some successes, uh, and so I'd be remiss not to point uh, to one or two of the successes that have come out of this process uh, in the recent past. Um, this slide depicts Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat was, uh, was a spinoff company founded in 2012 um, uh, using technology developed by several of our bioengineering faculty. And of course, it features a plant-based meat substitute. If you haven't tried these burgers or these chicken substitutes, they're very tasty, they're very authentic, and in fact, now they've been picked up by some 19,000 retail stores, uh, in, including uh, Whole Foods. Uh, they've been picked up by restaurants uh, across the country. Uh, in fact, uh, 
while I was uh, at the um, Liberty Bowl uh, with the football team over the holiday, uh, we stopped in at a local restaurant there on Beale Street, and it, sure enough, on the menu was Beyond Meat burgers. Uh, so I was uh, pleasantly surprised. So uh, this is the, uh, a, a company that opened its first plant in Colombia, and, uh, uh, and then hired uh, several hundred workers in that plant and has since spun off into a national company. You're going to hear a little bit more about elemental enzymes. Um, Katie Thompson is on your program for tomorrow. I don't know if Katie's here tonight, but if not, she'll be here tomorrow. Katie Thompson and her husband uh, started elemental enzymes along with a faculty member uh, uh, here at Mizzou. Uh, it was founded uh, in 2011. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's based upon the fact that um, um, uh, a technology that allows uh, cu the coupling of very important um, enzymatic processes to very stabilizing influences that can be uh, that can be displayed in the environment uh, under conditions where they're much more stable and capable of, um, of, of existing in hazardous uh, and harsh environmental conditions. Uh, they use this technology uh, for things like uh, soil remediation for increasing crop yield by uh, 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 plant growth stimulation, and they have many, many, many other ideas that are incubating at this particular point in time. Now, um, one of the initiatives uh, that leads to successful in innovation, and, and uh, in listening to Rodolph talk last night about the Centennial Campus at North Carolina State, and, uh, and the, um, uh, the entire uh, research uh, innovation enterprise there, uh, at Research Triangle Park, um, we've got a long ways to go uh, to uh, keep up with some of our peer institutions in that area, but we have a pretty good start on some of those things. Uh, we have an incubator uh, that sits over uh, in uh, uh, our research commons area over by the Dalton Cardiovascular Center. Bill Turpin, who's the uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Economic Development, also runs that incubator and, and uses that to uh, help our startup companies uh, get their early legs uh, as they try to develop their technologies further. Um, we have uh, also developed a business uh, park uh, that we call Discovery Ridge. This park was developed in 2005. It was a partnership between the state and national uh, private and public partners. It includes about 100 acres at this point in time in the master plan, and we have recruited a couple of tenants there who have facilities already in place and a new tenant that's coming online in the next six to nine months. Uh, some of those tenants include EAG Labs, which most of you know as ABC Labs, founded by um, uh, Charles Gerke, one of our biochemistry faculty members. ABC Labs is involved very heavily uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, uh, environmental remediation uh, uh, business and, and also testing services for pharmaceutical industries. Uh, animal health industries and um, and uh, crop product, uh, production industries. Uh, uh, ABC Labs or now EAG Labs employs significant number of uh, uh, people in the in the uh, community as well. The newest enterprise to go in out there, and hopefully uh, they'll begin uh, again uh, developing their facility uh, in the next couple of months. Uh, is a uh, company that's, that's really based upon uh, its interaction with our 10 megawatt nuclear reactor. As all of you know, uh, that reactor is the most uh, powerful nuclear reactor in the country on a university uh, facility, on a university campus, and it has the capability to develop a significant number of radioisotopes, uh, proton sources, neutron sources for various biomedical uh, and pharmaceutical uh, applications. That reactor has brought to market four different radio pharmaceutical drugs that are currently in practice in, um, uh, in, in treatment of inoperable cancers. Northwest Medical Isotopes is a company that, that works very closely with the reactor to distribute some of the isotopes that are produced uh, by the reactor uh, we are the only reactor now in the country that produces iodine-131 for treating thyroid cancers, and we hope to be in a position very soon to be generating Molly-99, the most, uh, uh, um, most utilized uh, radio imaging agent 
uh, in hospitals around the country. And again, no reactor in all of uh, North and nor of the Western Hemisphere, as a matter of fact, uh, produces Molly 99. So this will be a significant achievement by our particular reactor. It also gives us the opportunity in, in terms of precision medicine to be at the forefront in developing radioisotopes and radioligands, not only for uh, uh, human clinical uh, applications, but also for plant-based uh, applications. Uh, and we've developed a very significant research group in conjunction with the reactor uh, to look at uh, radio tracer um, uh, uh, capabilities to look at metabolism in plants. Uh, in fact, Rich Ferrari, who's uh, here in the audience as well, is really kind of uh, um, um, uh, thinking a little bit outside the box. He wants us to work with some of the imaging companies to develop, to develop a, uh, a vertical um, a CT scanner so that we can run uh, corn stalks uh, through at a very high pace. So we're going to hope, hopefully help uh, Rich work with some companies to try to develop that idea. All right, so that leads me to where you're really interested, and that is to talk about tonight's speaker. Um, as many of you have heard, uh, there is a revolution going on, an innovation revolution going on in many different aspects of what we do that's based upon a technology called CRISPR, the technology that uh, Rodolphe um, was uh, intimately involved in in its very, very early stages, and he's used that technology in many different ways, uh, not only in his basic research, but also in innovations that he's spinning off now into products that I'm sure he's going to tell you a little bit about. I was going to spend a couple of slides explaining to you what CRISPR is, but I'm pretty sure that that's per what Rodolphe is going to do, so in, in he's far more knowledgeable about that uh, than I am. I am going to tell you, however, that there are uh, significant uh, innovations going on on this campus using this technology. And I'm just going to point out two to you very quickly. Uh, we have used this technology in an important uh, animal model, mouse model, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And Duchenne, by the way, is misspelled on this slide, so I apologize. Um, Dong Shen Duan is one of our um, leading uh, biomedical innovators over in the School of Medicine. He's been working for many decades on a gene therapy treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As many of you know, an X-linked genetic trait that affects many uh, male, um, uh, males born uh, in uh, this country and around the world. Uh, it uh, leads to severe uh, uh, muscular uh, atrophy, neuromuscular uh, 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 degeneration o over a very short period of time. And the gene uh, that has that it at fault here is one of the largest genes in the human genome. Consequently, it has to be manipulated significantly in order to be available for gene therapy technologies. Um, on the other hand, uh, CRISPR offers a new opportunity to go in and uh, edit uh, genetic mutations that are um, uh, uh, clearly uh, responsible for many forms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And the recent work in Dr. Dewan's laboratory has led uh, to the development of uh, a, a, a hope for some of these particular patients. In mouse models, the therapy is uh, effective for out to 18 months uh, as compared to uh, the three months uh, in previous technologies. And another very important technology uh, use of CRISPR is, of course, in genetic editing of uh, animal models. Um, Randy Prather uh, and Kevin Wells and their group in animal sciences have produced, uh, have used the CRISPR technology to produce pigs, for example, that are res resistant to two very important economically damaging viruses that affect the pork industry. Uh, they are also working using CRISPR technology on the development of human models for animal diseases. So again, uh, that this technology uh, is, uh, uh, is really poised to revolu revolutionize a lot of the research projects in many universities around the country. All right, Th so where we are is um, to really uh, immerse you in CRISPR technology uh, through the work of our keynote speaker. Uh, and I'm very, uh, very honored to be able to introduce to you Rodolf 
Baron Gu. Rodolf uh, uh, actually is a, a very close associate of, um, of um, um, the new dean of our agricultural college, uh, uh, Chris Dalbert. Uh, and uh, Chris was instrumental in bringing Rodolf to our campus. Uh, I, I uh, did a little background uh, on, um, on Rodolf. Uh, actually, he filled me in quite a bit last night. You know, he's got a, uh, he's got a documentary coming out. Um, I understand it's going to go to South by Southwest. Can I say that? Oh, it's going to go to South by Southwest. We hope it comes to True False. So we're going to be uh, making a pitch for that to come to True False as well. Um, so uh, so uh, uh, as you will see from uh, Rodolf's presentation, he's been a very innovative scientist. Um, he's, he's, he was on the ground floor, as I said earlier, in the development of the CRISPR technology, and he's used that in many different venues uh, as he's developed his career uh, and, his, um, uh, and, uh, and many different companies that he's spun off. Uh, I was intrigued by one statement I found that said that Rodolf has been described as the CRISPR whisperer. I'll let him explain what that means. Rodolphe is a native of Paris, uh, where he grew up idolizing some of the great French scientists um, of, uh, uh, of the early days of microbiology and radiology and, uh, and um, uh, uh, aeronautics and so on, and actually plant genetics, Gregor Mendel. Uh, he's now a food scientist. He is the Todd R. Clanhammer Distinguished Professor of Probiotics at North Carolina State University. And Baron Gu describes himself actually as a CRISPR chef. I'll let him explain that as well. For more than a decade, he and his team have been using CRISPR sex, uh, uh, sequences to vaccinate uh, bacteria against uh, common um, uh, phage uh, in the dairy industry. And he's now developed CRISPR as a technology, a, 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 the use of CRISPR as a, an effective technology in the production of antimicrobial um, 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 treatment of different um, bacterial diseases. His lab at North Carolina State is described to have three goals, to understand CRISPR and how it works in bacteria, to use that understanding to develop technology, and to use those technologies to generate better bacteria and probiotic strains for use in food. So, uh, Dr. Baron Gu received his bachelor's degree at the University of Paris, his master's degrees from the University of Technology at Compagnie and uh, North Carolina State, and his doctorate at North Carolina State University. He uh, began to work for DuPont for several years, and at, during that point in time, he decided to um, uh, um, um, entertain the idea of an MBA from, uh, from uh, Wisconsin. Uh, so he generated an MBA, and he, as he told us last night at dinner, that may be one of the most exciting degrees uh, programs that he's gone through in terms of him being able to utilize that degree in what he's doing these days. He's won the Canada Ge uh, Geidner Award and the Warren Alper Foundation Prize, and in 2018, uh, Dr. Baron Gu was elected to the National Academy of Sciences and won the Academy's Prize in Food and Agricultural Sciences. Please join, join me in welcoming Rodolf Barangu.